Hey everyone, welcome to another question show. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are on my channel, go ahead, just type in your question. I'll gather them all up and I'll answer them here. Also, it's autumn on Vancouver Island, so get used to this for a couple of weeks. All right, let's get into the questions. Puffs Coco. So if Elon Musk lands people on Mars and sets up labs and then buildings and so on, does that make Mars his planet? Does he then become president and ruler of Mars, claimed by him? The Outer Space Treaty has very specific rules about ownership of things in space. We did a whole episode on this, but the bottom line is, is that no nation is allowed to own any part of outer space. And that you're allowed to build research stations and buildings on other worlds, but if you do, you have to make those, those buildings accessible to anyone who wants to be able to use them. It's sort of this idea of like this research concept. And so as long as, as SpaceX, Elon Musk, all of that has some dependence on Earth, Earth law will really be able to have leverage over anything that they do. It, you can imagine some far future though when the Mars colony is completely self-sufficient and doesn't require anything from Earth. And then at that point, you can kind of imagine them rebelling and then they get to make up their own rules however they want to do them. But as long as they're dependent on Earth for, for money, for supplies, they're going to fall under whatever rules Earth decides, the United Nations decides to set up. But you can imagine some future where maybe the United Nations comes together and starts to come up with new rules for property ownership that kind of change how that's going to work. But right now, if you want to send, uh, you know, build a city on Mars, you don't actually own it. Ionomies. Speaking of the moon's aesthetic, has it changed at all during recorded history with new craters or something of the sort, other than whatever we left behind, of course? Well, obviously, there are space rocks crashing into the moon all the time, little ones, bigger ones, and there actually is a lot of observations being done all the time on the moon and some of those impacts have been recorded. People have seen the little flash of light on the surface of the moon. And there's a great spacecraft orbiting the moon called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's got a really powerful telescope and it has spotted new craters. Not big, big ones like happened millions and billions of years ago, but there are small craters a few meters across that are constantly being dug out and they turn up from time to time. So the moon is still being resurfaced kind of all the time. AK-101 Farhan, can you grow plants on lunar soil? So this relates to the question that we had about whether you can grow plants in Martian soil, right? The Martian regolith. The Martian regolith is just pulverized volcanic rock from Mars that's been weathered by the wind and maybe water in the past. There's a similar substance on the moon and it's called the lunar regolith and it is pounded up volcanic moon rock. Now the problem with the stuff on the moon is that it is very sharp and jagged and it's kind of like, like little pieces of glass and so if you breathe it, it can cause problems, possibly even uh, you know, various kinds of like lung infections, so it's pretty dangerous stuff. But for sure, um, there are researchers here that are working to use both lunar regolith and Martian regolith to see if they can grow crops in this stuff because that's gonna be something that people are gonna to wanna to do. Now they don't actually have real dirt from Mars because of course nobody's ever returned a sample back from Mars, but they make a substitute. They make a, you know, a material that is as close as possible to what you're gonna find on the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars. And as long as they add the organic materials, the fertilizer, things like that, they can grow crops in the, in the lunar regolith. Now, one of the things that I think they're probably gonna to wanna to have to do is that because that lunar regolith is so sharp and kind of dangerous, they're probably gonna to wanna to artificially weather it. They're gonna probably put it in some kind of rock tumbler to, to sort of smooth out the edges and make it less dangerous, but still be a good substrate for growing plants in. But absolutely, they will be able to use that material as part of their growing environment when they put people on the moon and on Mars. But also NASA's done a lot of work in hydroponics and just growing stuff in, you know, in water with nutrients in it. And, and you can do that here on Earth too. So, 
So growing in dirt won't necessarily be a big requirement when we go to space and, and other worlds. Veggie T 2009. One of the most underrated pieces of fictional technology from Star Trek are the sensors, which are able to scan planets at short range, detecting everything from the number of biosigns to tectonic activity. And my question is, is this tech even anything? What needs to be developed to have this kind of capability? This technology that you're talking about, the ability to scan some distant object, planet, rock, and be able to understand, understand what it's made out of, is, is technology that we have today. In fact, this is one of the main tools that astronomers and geologists, planetary geologists use to study the, the sort of the solar system. So when astronomers look at stars, they can break up the light from those stars into a spectrum. And by looking at that spectrum, they can know what that star is made out of just by looking at the light that's coming from it. They can do the same thing with, say, reflected light. They can do things when they, they have artificial light, like the, uh, the Mars rover has a laser on board that it can use to, sh to zap things. So there is a lot of ability to be able to see this stuff from, from afar. And so you can kind of imagine, you know, it really just depends on how big your equipment is to be able to break up the light from what you're looking at and be able to turn to that spectrum to be able to analyze what it's made of. But, but this absolutely exists. Not Star Trek level where you can actually, you know, scan a planet and know that there, how many people there are and where they are and light forms and stuff. But you can, you can kind of imagine breaking that up into different kinds of technologies. So, for example, under the infrared spectrum, a human being glows brighter than, say, the background. And so if you switch to an infrared, you could see life forms. And you can imagine different kinds of ways to approach that. Right now, there isn't a sort of one, one stop shop yet, but you can imagine in the future, they will have different kinds of technology together to be able to do that. Uh, there's a great book that just came out from Dr. Ethan Siegel called Treknology, and he goes into a lot of the technology, warp drives and tricorders and, and scanning systems, and you should definitely check that out. Barrett Bogner. Has there ever been talk of a space elevator on the moon? We hear about the moon being a pit stop for exploring other planets, but do any of these moon-based plans call for a space elevator? Is it possible with the current materials? Yeah, the moon is actually a great place for putting a space elevator. And the cool thing about it, as you sort of hinted at, is that you don't need any technology beyond the kinds of materials that we have today. So, uh, for example, there's the, this material called spectra, which is this really tough sort of Kevlar-y kind of, of fabric. And, and you can uh, build a tether out of this spectra and it can support a space elevator from the moon. And then so you just need to have a counterbalance that goes out to like the, the L1 moon Earth Lagrange point and it sits there. And then you could have elevators go up from the surface of the moon, reach the L1 point and then zip off into orbit or go to return to Earth or do whatever they want. So in fact, I'll bet you, I will guess that we will see an elevator on the moon before we see an elevator on Earth just because the, the 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 materials required to build that that elevator and 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 the tether are within the realm of what we have right now as opposed to some future maybe impossible carbon nanotube structure so that's i i think the moon is the place toposaurus top 10 my friend does not believe in time dilation he says the time is only a measurement that humans invented well then you should tell your friend to take his or her cell phone with GPS and throw it away and never trust it because the satellites that are orbiting the earth are moving around the earth at tens of thousands of kilometers per hour and they're moving so fast that that when they send signals to earth your phone has the math in it to account for the time dilation for how fast these satellites are going and so GPS would be inaccurate if they weren't accounting for the time dilation because everything is moving so quickly. So time dilation is absolutely a thing and not a human uh, invention. It is a 
underlying, uh, it's in the fabric of the universe. So, sorry, your friend, Richard. On the topic of deorbiting things, if an asteroid aimed at the Earth and threw at regular Earth-based throwing speed, would the speed be enough momentum to make the object eventually burn up in the atmosphere? So I understand the scenario. You've got an astronaut who's going around the Earth. They've got like a baseball or a rock or a glove or something, and they, they look down at the Earth and they throw the object down. And does, is that enough to make it deorbit? And, and it's important to sort of understand that that's not how orbits work. And I always say that, you know, if you play Kerbal Space Program, you will understand at this deep level how this all kind of works. So, so if you like aim at the Earth and you throw your, the ball towards the Earth, all you're really doing is you're changing the orbit. So you're essentially adding, a, you're creating, giving it a different uh, apoapsis and periapsis. You're giving it a different height where it sort of reaches the farthest point from the Earth and then a different point where it reaches the closest point to the Earth. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere because you're not giving it any more thrust. You're just giving it this one change in its velocity. The most effective way that you could try to change the orbit of the object that you're, you're getting rid of is if you threw it in the exact opposite direction of what you're going. So in other words, if you're going around the Earth this way, you would want to throw the ball the opposite direction. And that would sort of decrease its speed that it's going compared to what it was doing before. But again, all that does is changes the orbit. It's not like it puts it onto some kind of spiral. It just means that the orbit is going to change. And if you're able to throw it hard enough, which you're not, right? I mean, an astronaut is going 28,000 kilometers per hour around the Earth you may be able to throw it at 100 kilometers per hour backwards. That's going to make no significant difference to what you're doing. Of course, if you're in low Earth orbit, you are going around the Earth, the atmosphere is slowing you down, and that the ball, rock, glove, whatever you're going to try and throw, is going to eventually burn up. It's going to interact with the atmosphere, slow down, and burn up. But, but in general, I think it's just really important to understand how orbits work, and I highly recommend again, that you play Kerbal Space Program. I, I, I've said this before, I learn more about how sort of orbital mechanics works from, from playing that game than I did from years and years of being a space journalist. So where does it go if you throw it straight down at the Earth? It, so now it's, it's, it's orbiting you a little below, and then later on in your orbit, it orbits a little higher. If you're going this way, yeah. So, so you're, you're going this way, and you throw it straight down. Straight down. So now you've just changed its orbit, and so it's just got a different orbit around the Earth that's a little tweaked from what you're doing. But how it's does so, it not just keep going straight down? Well, because it's also going this way. It's going to miss the Earth. So it's going this way, and it's going to miss the Earth. And now it's so. Imagine if it was a circle, and you throw it down. It's going to just now have a little bit of a slight angle to the ellipse that it's following around the Earth. Right? It's only if you could throw it at, say, if you could turn around and you could throw it at 28,000 kilometers per hour in the opposite direction, now the ball would be m not moving at all compared to the Earth and it would indeed drop. But anything else is going to continue to orbit the Earth. Now the atmosphere of the Earth, you know, at some point it will interact with the atmosphere of the Earth. So anyway, there you go. RPK vids. When the universe was smaller than an atom, were physics the same as they are now? Like, was there gravity, heat, cold, etc.? If you run the, the clock backwards on the, on the Big Bang, right? the Big Bang, everything is expanding in the universe, and if you turn the clock backwards and you run it back, then you can imagine this, this early time, 13.8 billion years ago, when all of the stuff that, that is now light years apart was really close to apart. And as things get closer and closer together, then they're going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. And at various temperatures, different forces of the universe come apart. And this is something that, is, that physicists do. They recreate these environments in these gigantic particle accelerators, like the Large Hadron Collider. And they found that at, the, at certain temperatures and pressures, the strong force 
the weak force, these sort of the forces that bind the atoms together and the force that deals with radioactivity, and the electromagnetic force, which is the you know magnetism and uh, uh, light and things like that were all different aspects of the same force and they were able to combine all those together but the one that they have been able to combine is gravity and so right now and this is like literally Nobel Prize if you can do this is if you can at the earliest moments of the universe come up with the math or come up with the experiments that explain and understand how gravity and and this, this combined force between the strong, the weak, and electromagnetism kind of come together. And this is still the great challenge that physicists have. But no, at the earliest moments, right after the Big Bang, there weren't the same kinds of things in the universe as there was when it cooled down to a point that these forces could actually split apart and do their own separate jobs. Live to learn. We eventually confirmed that Mars, Europa, Titan, Enceladus, etc. are biologically dead. Would it make any sense to send some extremophiles to check if they could survive long term? So, assuming that they're biologically dead, we're not going to kill any native life forms, then my feeling is that it is our job to seed these places with life. Because if something catastrophic happens to Earth, then maybe, just maybe, the Martian tardigrades or the European slime mold will somehow become conscious and sentient and, and colonize the universe. There are life forms right now that could survive on Mars today. And there's some kinds of methanogen bacteria, there's some kinds of lichens that can survive on Mars, and it, you know, it's theoretically possible that we could come up with some other life forms that could probably do that the environment in Europa and Enceladus. We don't really know what it's really like down there yet, but water with some form of hydrogen is providing food. We can imagine all kinds of life forms from Earth that could survive in there, although there could be toxins that might kill them as well. So, uh, yeah, I think that if we did find that they were dead and we were certain, 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 then I think it makes sense for us to start trying to seed those places with various kinds of life from Earth. Anna Kityadev. If we could physically feel gravitational waves, what would it be like? Because of the discovery of the gravitational waves, I've had this question quite a bit. Gravitational waves, as they pass through the Earth, the way they're detected by LIGO is that they measure, essentially, as the wave ripples through the Earth, it pulls the two detectors apart and then pulls them back together again, and there's a laser beam that's bouncing back and forth in between them, and the, it's so sensitive that it can tell when that beam has, has been stretched, essentially. And so, matter is physically being stretched, and so if you're really close to a neutron star that's colliding, or a black hole that was coming together, you would feel these, these gravitational waves passing over your body, and they would be pulling you and pushing you in the direction that the waves are, are traveling. And if you were close enough, it would be catastrophic. You would get torn apart. But the thing is, is with black holes and things like that, there are tidal forces from the gravity as well, which are doing this, this idea of spaghettification. So you, so, you know, exactly how much you would experience from the tidal forces compared to the ones you would feel from the gravitational waves, that's, you know, I need to get some physicists to do the math for me to actually come up with the numbers. So I'll, I'll probably do this as a video later on. Ryan Blatz. Dark matter is just a gap fill for flawed mathematics. Fix your math and stop making excuses. <laughs> um, so here's the thing with dark matter, right? It's, and I love this. Sort of, people have this knee-jerk reaction to dark matter. And the analogy here is, let's imagine that you're driving your car and it's making some kind of bonking noise. And you don't know what's causing the noise. You know that something, this is not the normal sound that the car makes, but you know that it's making some kind of noise. And so you go and take it to the shop and you say, the car is making some kind of noise. And they go, oh, well, I wonder if it's a problem with the engine. And then they take apart the engine. They go, nope, the engine is just fine. And then you go for a drive. And then, and then you realize that as you're driving up a hill, it makes this clunking noise and you're like oh and you take it back to the mechanic and you explain oh there's this problem with you know here's this clanking noise and when I go up the hill I get this problem and they're like oh well thanks for the additional information now we know that when the engine's under load then it's a problem and they work through this troubleshooting to get to the bottom of it 
Astronomers know for certain that there is this thing, this dark matter, in that there are, you know, there are amounts of material that seem to be more, or sorry, there are galaxies which rotate and they should be tearing themselves apart, but for some reason they don't. And there is gravitational lensing where astronomers look out into space in all directions and watch how how blobs of invisible matter, very specific blobs in specific locations, are changing the, the direction of the light, like ripples in, in water. And so something, some invisible thing, is actually causing light to change. This stuff is out there, and right now astronomers don't know what it is. So it's not a flaw in the math, right? It is essentially an undiscovered thing that they're now trying to figure out what it is. And maybe it will be a, a flaw in the math later on, or maybe they're going to figure out that it's a particle, or maybe they're going to figure out that gravity doesn't work the way they thought at the scales that, you know, that the universe operates at, or maybe there's clouds of microscopic black holes out there in the universe, although not very many people believe that, so don't write me an angry letter. But, so there are different possibilities for what this is. And, I, and sort of that knee-jerk response for a person who maybe hasn't spent all of their time making the observations, looking at the data, mapping these, these structures out there in tremendous detail, it's kind of, you know, it's sort of like you're not doing your homework. And so I think that, I mean, obviously, you know, it's YouTube, right? And anyone can just type whatever they want and, and call it a day and walk on. But, but yeah, so I think that, that for those of the people who, who, who they don't like the feeling of it, well, we are in the middle of this thing getting discovered. And so this is what the process feels like. It's, it was, this was the process when people were trying to understand how the sun operated or what, how evolution worked or how, uh, you know, how the sedimentary layers and how the earth formed, all of these things, all these, the settled science that we understand today took time where scientists were struggling to gather the data and understand and put together the best models that fit the evidence that they were seeing, throwing some ideas out, trying other ideas on, and just working their way to a more thorough understanding of what that is. And this is dark matter, and this is dark energy, and you are in the middle of it right now, watching astronomers figure this out. All right. Thanks for everybody's questions. Uh, this is a lot of fun. Uh, remember, wherever you are, anywhere across the channel, just go ahead, just type in your question, gather them up, and I will answer them here. As always, here is a playlist of what I'm watching on YouTube right now, so you should watch them. <laughs>